record button. So just hit continue or leave the meeting if you don't want it to be recorded. And Esmeralda has also put the um, link on the chat for everybody um, to please sign in and record your attendance. Again, I'll say we're not trying to uh, take attendance or anything of the sort. We just want to be able to report on a regular basis how many people come to our seminars and to, to look um, to make sure that, you know, to monitor uh, different topics and stuff like that and make sure that um, we're hitting the topics that people are uh, particularly interested in. Um, so without further ado, can you send that link again, Esmeralda? Um, without further ado, let me um, introduce our guests today. We're um, very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Mario Small, uh, who is the Grafstein family professor at uh, Harvard University in the Department of Sociology. He received his PhD from Harvard in sociology and has held faculty positions at a number of places, including Princeton, um, the University of Chicago, where he was also department chair and dean of social science, um, and at Harvard, where he is now. Um, and his wide ranging research is focused on a lot of different topics, but very interrelated topics, um, including social networks, poverty, organizations, culture, methods, neighborhoods, institutions, and, and other topics. And he's got, um, his latest book is called uh, Someone to Talk To, which is a study of who people approach when they need support. And also uh, intriguingly, um, the role of qualitative research um, in a big data world. So um, today he's gonna to be talking about banks, alternative institutions and the spatial uh, temporal ecology of racial inequality. So Mario, I'll turn it over to you and thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for that introduction. Uh, so the first thing I'm gonna to try to do is share the screen and confirm that that actually worked. Yep. And uh, what you can see is the entire screen with the slides, not a tiny screen with uh, notes on it. Awesome. Okay, so um, uh, so I'll say two things uh, before I get started. Uh, in addition to thank you for the invitation, it's really a pleasure to be here. So uh, first I'll say that um, uh, in spite of the title, I come at this project from the perspective of somebody who knows something about neighborhoods, uh, but very little about banking. And so those of you uh, who know a lot about banking, I really welcome your comments and your thoughts because this is very much a new field to me. As you'll see, uh, it was an understanding of neighborhoods that, that motivated this project. Uh, the second thing I must say is uh, um, I have to apologize for the uh, title, which I think uh, can fairly be described as a little pretentious. Um, uh, and it turns out that the rationale behind the title is uh, we sent a version of this paper to one of the generalist science journals and uh, and we think that uh, calling it the spatial temporal ecology made it seem more scientific. Uh, we'll see if that actually works. Okay, so um, uh, let's see. Let's see if I can make this work. There we go. So the issue. So what I'm going to uh, examine today is the accessibility of banking services in minority neighborhoods. Um, actually minority and high poverty neighborhoods, but I'm really going to focus on the racial composition for the purposes of this talk. And so just to give you a brief outline, first I'm gonna describe the motivation behind this project. Uh, uh, second, the approach and the specific question I'm gonna ask. Third, the data we're using to answer the question. Uh, fourth, the findings. And fifth, a little bit about ongoing work that's gonna help us, I hope, uh, uh, understand some of the findings. So the motivation. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and assert that neighborhood conditions matter. Um, I think everybody here is familiar with the neighborhood effects literature. Uh, which has found that uh, living or growing up in a high poverty or predominantly minority or disadvantaged neighborhood uh, has been shown to have an impact uh, on subjective well being, physical health, earnings, college attendance, childbearing, marriage, or vulnerability, and many other outcomes. And when I say shown um, an impact, I mean uh, both through experimental studies like the moving to opportunity experiments and also the analysis of large scale millions of records, uh, tax data from which you can make much more plausible causal inferences than you could otherwise. And I won't spend a lot of time assessing that literature. Um, I, I think at this point, 
uh, the broad statement that neighborhood effects exist uh, and that they affect uh, many people for many outcomes in many contexts is probably uncontroversial. Uh, uh, beyond that, there's a lot of debate about when and how much and how, and I'll just leave that aside because it doesn't actually matter for our talk. Uh, I think the more interesting question that, that, that I'm interested in is sort of how, you know, what is it that uh, uh, makes a, a highly disadvantaged or predominantly minority or high poverty neighborhood a difficult place to be? And I'm gonna focus on one set of explanations which have to do with resource access. Uh, you've, many of you I'm sure have heard the term food deserts, uh, which describes uh, places where it's difficult to find, these are again neighborhoods where it's difficult to find fresh foods and vegetables, uh, uh, organic foods and so on. Um, in this literature, uh, people have used the term school deserts and banking deserts to describe a similar idea. Places where respectively it's difficult to find good foods or decent schools or banking services. And my focus of course is banking services. So uh, why banking services? I don't think it's a very controversial statement to make that access to banking services is important. Uh, if you care about mobility, uh, it's the way you get educational loans, business loans, and other things. If you care about well-being, uh, not just mortgages and home equity loans, but emergency loans, check cashing, uh, transfers, remittances to other countries, credit. I mean, there's a whole slew of uh, aspects of living in the contemporary society for which having access to banking services is important. However, we live in an internet age and uh, you can do a lot of banking online. And so uh, why would we care about whether access to banking services is affected to neighbor by neighborhoods today? For a couple of reasons. So one, it turns out that in spite of the rapid increase in mobile technology and online technology, brick and mortar branches continue to experience high levels of use, particularly among low income populations. So just some examples. So between 2009 and 2019, there were 17,000 new branches uh, open in the United States uh, for a number of reasons, uh, customers. So uh, it turns out that uh, the Federal Reserve Bank has been interviewing people about what is the most important thing that they care about when choosing a financial institution. Uh, in 1989, something like 49% of respondents said location, literally the physical location. Um, in 1990, that number dropped to about 44%, and it stayed at around 44% until at least 2013, the latest year for which we have data. And over that entire period, location remained the single most important reason people reported for choosing an institution. This is nationally representative data. Uh, another reason has to do with practice. Uh, so in 2016, a different Federal Reserve Bank study, and by the way, so you see the citations at the bottom there. If you're interested in any of these papers, uh, send me an email. I have an updated version of the paper itself that I can send you with all of the citations. In 2016, um, again, a national representative sample, 84% reported that over the last year, they had gone to a physical bank and spoken to a teller there. Uh, so not just ATMs, literally going to a physical bank and spoken to the individual behind the desk. And in fact, this was the most common way, the way that was most commonly reported for accessing uh, uh, banking services over that year. This is 2016. Um, another issue is needs. It turns out that part of the reason people end up continuing to go to branches is that for a lot of uh, things you need, like disputes to close accounts for many kinds of loans, you need to go in person and show an ID. Um, part of the show ID part was probably uh, uh, one of the consequences of 9-11 after which there were greater restrictions on uh, the possibility of um, unregulated resources going to terrorists and others, and the, the requirement to show yourself in person and show, show ID actually increased for many kinds of services. And finally, uh, banks want them. So it turns out it's easier for a bank to sell you a product that you otherwise probably wouldn't even want in person uh, than to do it uh, online or as a, fault, a result of just going through the ATM and swiping and getting your cash. But in addition, it turns out that physical proximity to a bank does affect banking. I'm not gonna sort of spend a lot of time on the study's results because we're just sort of in the motivation stage, but it turns out that having no bank either within three miles or within not five miles of your residence, and this is again from a nationally representative sample uh, uh, by, this is a study by Goodstein and Ryan, um, uh, increase the probability that you did not have a bank account. 
and that association was strong. It's an association, obviously, it's not an experiment. Um, that association was a cross sectional study. That association was strongest for uh, lower income households, meaning the population for which you most care about the possibility of neighborhood effects. Okay, so um, how am I going to approach this question? So I think there's actually, in spite of the attractiveness of the term front banking desert, and it's a term that's out there, um, I think the term is actually imperfect for two reasons. Um, first, um, if you picture a bank, it sort of implies an area, right? It's sort of, uh, sorry, a desert, it implies an area. And, um, and an area is actually not, I think, the best way to conceive of accessibility. And what do I mean by this? And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna describe uh, my experience. By the way, some of you might know that um, I started my career as a field worker, and it turns out, as you'll see, that that very much informs how I'm approaching this question. So this is uh, Harlem. Um, for those of you who've been in New York, this is uh, Upper Manhattan. And um, I lived uh, as, uh, when I was at Princeton, I lived in, in New York the whole time. I lived in, in Harlem. And I lived uh, right here where you see, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Are you able to see my cursor? Awesome. So I lived uh, here. That is literally my address uh, in Harlem when I was living there. And um, at the time, shortly before I moved there, um, Harlem had been described as a food desert, right? A place you can't find any food. Um, and shortly before I moved there, a new supermarket, a Pathmark, opened right there where you see that star. And it was a big news, it was all over. The idea was that we're finally, Harlem is no longer a food desert. There's finally sort of the accessibility of fresh foods and services of the kind that you can find in a large supermarket. Now, here's what's interesting. Even though um, that was objectively my closest uh, uh, supermarket, and it was in fact uh, not quite in my zip code, uh, but uh, very near to the zip code, uh, very adjacent to the zip code where I lived, I never went there. I lived there for five years and I did not go there once. And the reason is that, um, oh, let me just close this out. The reason is that in order to get to this neighborhood, what you have to do is either walk or take the A train from 140, or the A, B, C, or D train from 145th Street down to 125th Street. So this is 125th Street. Uh, this is 145th Street. This is 135th Street. You have to take the train down or walk down and then wait for the crosstown bus and take that bus across to get to the, to get to the supermarket. It, takes, it took up, believe it or not, it took about an hour. In fact, we used to have a joke uh, from people who lived in my neighborhood that no matter where you were on the east side, it takes an hour to get to the east side. That's literally, whether it's up here and all the way down here because of a configuration of public transit. In fact, I can get all the way down here to where there's a brand new supermarket shortly after I moved right on uh, Lincoln, uh, right near Lincoln Center in about 15 minutes, um, 20 minutes because the A train was right near where I lived and I can just hop on and go down there. In fact, I was even much more likely to go to Chinatown which I could get to in 25 minutes and then take the train all the way back up than I could get, than I could in fact use the resource in my supposed no longer food desert. And so what I'm saying is from a methodological perspective, even though the idea of a banking desert is appealing, um, thinking about uh, approaching this question by for example, counting the number of banks in my zip code or in a tract or something like that, it's actually not a very good way of thinking about accessibility because like me, a, a lot of the way we actually physically traverse cities uh, is such that a presumably inaccessible place might be accessible and a place where there's presumably high degrees of, an accessibi of accessibility doesn't actually have accessibility. So what I'd like to say is that a better way of measuring accessibility is not what is the area, but how easy is it to get to from where I live? So the first thing I'm going to do is approach the question by thinking of how easy is it to get to the resource from where I live. The second problem with the term sort of banking desert is that it implies sort of a barrenness. It's in this place where there's just nothing there, right? And, um, and that's actually quite right. Um, thinking back on the idea of food deserts, for example, it's not as if there was no place to buy any food whatsoever. It was that it was much closer for me to go to the bodega across the street 
that had canned foods, sugary foods, very few fresh fruits and vegetables, nothing organic, than it was for me to go to the farther fat mark that had fresh foods, and, uh, fresh foods, you know, organic foods and so on. In other words, it wasn't so much that there was nothing here. It's the uh, relative undesirability of the things that are near me uh, and the desirability of things that were far from me. And I think there's something similar with respect to banks. It's not that you can't get financial services in high poverty neighborhoods or in minority neighborhoods, is that at least if we believe the ethnographers, that a lot of what you can get are actually alternative financial institutions that are not desirable in the way banks are. I know that that term is charged and I'm happy to have a conversation about that at some point, but for the moment, I think it's a fair uh, comparison to make for the following reasons. So first, what I mean by alternative financial institutions in this paper, I'm referring to payday lenders and check cashing places primarily, okay? And so you've seen it's these uh, uh, probably, uh, I'm sure in LA, uh, places, you know, like California check cashing stores, actually a big one in California, uh, Cash Advance in Advance America, uh, in New York, they're actually all called check cashing places. Um, they vary by jurisdiction, but that's the core idea. And these are places that have a couple of important characteristics. First, high fees. So for example, uh, standard uh, fee in a check cashing place is literally 10% of your check to cash $1,000 in a personal check. Okay, usually you go in, you give them the check, they give you the money, uh, but they keep 10%. It's quite high. And the bank, as you know, it's essentially free as long as you have an account. Uh, in payday lending, it's actually even more serious. So a typical payday loan, it's something like $17.50 per $100 in loans. And so you would go in right now, and the way the payday loan works is sort of they give you a loan on a very short-term basis, say two weeks, on the basis of some check you have. So uh, your social security check or uh, your pay stub, for example, this is part of why they call payday loans. And the way it works is you show proof that you're gonna get those. You write them a post-dated check. Uh, they take the check and a two week period, they either throw, uh, tear it up if you pay them back um, or if you tell them that you can't, don't actually have any money there, uh, you re-enter into a different kind of loan, okay? And this is part of why the loans are called predatory. If, um, if, uh, if you have the money, uh, a typical rate, for example, for a 400 loan would be about $70. Uh, and again, a typical $400, $70 interest loan payable in two weeks, annualized turns out to about a 450% APR, which is huge. Okay, and so um, th they are very often adequately described as predatory. I do want to say that there are potential benefits. Uh, so many of these, for example, are open later than banks. Uh, in over the course of the day, they'll open until you know eight, nine, ten o'clock at night. Some, some even twenty-four hours. And so for people with irregular hours and so on, they can actually be more convenient. But at some point, I'll talk more about how much that matters. But that's the core idea. Um, so I'm interested in starting here by Meltzer uh, that looks at the consequences of payday loans. Um, so this is uh, based on national data. So they, um, they found that um, some 40% of payday loan borrowers uh, face an annual interest burden of at least $500. And these are people who typically had incomes in the range of fifteen dollars to $60,000 and 10% paid uh, $1,000 in interest annually. So you can actually end up in quite a bit of debt as a result of participating in and it turns out also that proxy, physical proximity to a payday lender also affects use or is associated with use. So uh, it's a nice paper by Friedline and Keeple, uh, 2016, used 2012 uh, national representative data on 24,000 adults and found that the number of AFIs in your zip code per thousand residents is associated with the frequency of use uh, with greater, more frequent use over the last, uh, over the last year. So, so that's the idea. So the question is straightforward. The question I'm gonna ask is very simple. Thinking both, both of these ideas that we think about access not as sort of describing the neighborhood, but thinking of the probability of, or the ease with which I can access an organization and thinking comparatively about the ease with which I can access an AFI versus the ease with which I can access a conventional bank, the, Question I'm gonna ask is whether the probability that the fastest to get to AFI is closer than the fastest to get to bank, uh, higher uh, in neighborhoods where the proportion minority, uh, particularly black or Latino are higher. 
That's it. Uh, that is literally the question I'm asking, and it's the only question. You will notice that it's a descriptive question, and there's no causal inference of any kind here. And yet, as I'm going to show you, answering that simple descriptive question is very hard. Um, but we found a way. Mario? So, yep, Mark, yep, I have, yep. A, I have a quick question. So, please. Presumably, that also depends, that the answer to that question also depends on, I mean, New York City is not the best example because most people don't have cars, but might depend on personal characteristics of individuals in the neighborhood too, right? Like driving, whether they have a, a car or some other vehicle and also where they work or where they go for other reasons during the day, right? Yes. Are you thinking That's about those great, or? That is a great question. So, um, uh, because it helps me clarify something. Uh, first, uh, the, the ease of getting there, obviously I'm talking about time, um, uh, I'm going to measure it three different ways. So how fast it is to walk to the nearest AFI versus walking to the nearest uh, bank, how fast it is to drive mm -hmm. uh, to the nearest bank versus driving to the nearest AFI, and how fast is it to take public transit to the nearest uh, AFI versus the nearest bank, um, number one. Uh, number two, the second question with respect to uh, sort of the place where you live, versus the place where you work. It's of course an important question and we can't answer it in this particular paper. I have another paper where we look at not commutes, but uh, over the uh, sort of travel uh, using different data, using Twitter data. Uh, in this paper, uh, the reason we're not answering that question is what we're gonna do is we're gonna take residential blocks. Uh, we're gonna figure out, uh, we're gonna literally take the block and take the center of the block and find out from the middle of that residential block, how fast is it to get there? And so, and we're gonna look at every single residential block in each of the 19 cities in our sample. Okay, and so some people work in residential blocks and we can't know that, uh, but we know for sure that many people live in residential blocks. That is by definition, uh, uh, what a residential block is. In our sample, you have to, uh, you, have to uh, you have to be in a block, in a block group with at least hundred people. And so we know we can make the inference about the conditions for people living there. Uh, I think we'd have to approach the project differently to make the inferences about conditions for people working in particular places. Not that it's not gonna be related, but, but that is why, okay? All right, so, so the way we did this, so the way to think about our sort of thought experiment, possibly the thought experiment that might help is, you know, suppose I take you right now and I plop you in a high poverty neighborhood or in fact, I plop you in sort of some distribution of neighborhoods out there and I say, well, find financial services. Uh, the idea is you go to your phone and you literally Google bank or you Google check cashing place or you Google payday lender and Google will tell you, um, uh, will literally show you a map based on its database called Google Maps of where those places are and how long it takes to get there. And so what we're doing is essentially taking those data with respect to the foot, public transit, and car travel, and figuring out how long it would take you to get there from each of the closest, um, from each of the, from each of the, each of each, every single block as residential in the 19 largest cities in the country. I'm gonna show you in a minute how that works, but before that I do that, I wanna make sure I describe the data. Yeah, I saw- uh, I, Yes, I, I started, this is Don Triman. I started oh, to yeah, ask, uh, uh, if you, you, yeah, we, I think, well, I know, and I suppose all of us know about the Google uh, uh, information about places near you and the map and so on. Do you have any <laughs> estimate of how accurate that information is? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. In fact, this is why this project took many years as opposed to a couple of months. So I will tell you, first of all, why I think that's such an important question. If I were giving this talk 10 years ago, I would say Google, Google data are not very good. And the reason we know is that um, in the mid aughts, um, Stacy Lindau at the University of Chicago conducted a study in the south side of Chicago where she was trying to look at health related, literally establishments in the neighborhood. And what she did is she hired a whole bunch of researchers from the neighborhood. So she hired a bunch of residents from the neighborhood, trained them, and they did a street by street canvas of much of the south side of Chicago uh, specifically near the University of Chicago. So Woodlawn and some parts of um, Englewood, and I don't remember the boundaries, but it was something like that, a good amount of 
a, a good uh, space. They, they did that literally space block by block, building by building, and they compared their data to the Google data. And what they found, I'm not gonna get the precise numbers right, but it was something like this, about half of the establishments the field researchers found were not on Google. And about half of the establishments Google said were there, were not there, were either already closed because of rapid closures and so on. So it was a problem. And if you had asked me, I would not have used Google data for that reason. It turns out over the ensuing 15 years, Google has gotten way better. And I actually believe that for this question, Google is the best data set that there is, and it is better than official records. And to explain why, um, I'll just walk you through that in a minute. So first, uh, think of Google Docs database as a big database. The first thing they do, I mean, they don't do this in this order, but imagine data set where you compile it by first taking official records and private administrative data. So literally you go to the Department of Commerce data that I would have used before, and you just extract the location of all banks, savings banks, any place you can get a savings account or a checking account uh, and do the same thing for, um, for places we call tech cashing places and places we call payday lenders. So you put that in your database. And then what you do is you see right here, uh, this car, this is the Google Street View car. As many of you know, this car has driven by every neighborhood in the country, including every neighborhood you've been, you've been in and work in and taken a photo of everything you can see from the top of the car, from this camera right here. Now, in a, so what Google does with those data is a whole bunch of things, including sort of giving you the street view uh, vision that you have on your maps in your, when you go to Google Maps. But that actually is not really from our researcher the most important thing it does. What it does is it takes photos of everything you can see about the establishment. For example, the signage, like, you know, cash advance or payday lending or whatever, right? And because Google has petabytes upon petabytes of data, they're actually pretty good at predicting whether that signage represents a real bank. So they take the administrative data and they improve the data with their massive amounts of um, Google Street Image data. Now remember, this happens repeatedly. So for example, my blog, I don't know how often, but I, my blog, um, I can go back, uh, to five different versions of, no, to four different versions of the car driving by my block uh, since I moved into Boston seven years ago, six and a half years ago. And so those data are updated repeatedly. The clarity, literally the data points on every single block are updated repeatedly. And so for many places, Google is going to have more current data from street view imagery than the official records, which are often updated once a year, both because the car might have passed since the data were updated, but also because you know, administrative you know, business owners don't always immediately tell uh, the government when they shut down, for example, or heck, when they open up uh, and so on. Uh, this is, a, this is Don, Don Triman again. This is a side Please. question, yeah. but are there, does Google provide access or how do you have access to the the last uh, uh, five uh, uh, routes of the car, of the Yeah, the so car. you can go right now, yeah. So if you put in your address uh, or the UCLA office, just go in, go to Street View, and then click on the top left. And this might have changed since the last time I did it. And you can go back in time, quote unquote, and look, just literally see a photo of that same space, you know, nine months ago, and then you can just scroll from the database from nine months ago, and you can do it going back some limited number of years. Um, I should say that I've done this multiple times. Google uh, repeatedly updates everything it does, uh, usually to make things harder for research. Well, usually to make things harder for people to get access to their data. Uh, so I will tell you that some of the data we got are harder to get than they were when we got them four years ago, okay? But um, the Google Street View image is actually only the second part of the reason these data are better than regular administrative data. The third part is crowdsourcing. So Google does a couple of things. And again, look, I'm not, I know it sounds like it, but I'm not an apologist for Google. In fact, I don't like the company, uh, but I became convinced uh, uh, of the quality of the data for a number of reasons. And I, and I kind of want to walk you through, uh, through, uh, through these uh, carefully. Um, so crowdsourcing. So Google has something called local guides. Some of you might actually be local guides. 
where, oh, there we go. Uh, I saw somebody nodding. Where the way it works is you log into your account and you get points for uh, correcting, updating, providing information uh, about something wrong in the Google Maps database. And it's, it's much more involved than what I just described, but what I'm showing you here, for example, is a simple description of what kind of contribution to Google Maps you can make and the points you earn. So for example, if you review it, you get 10 points, you just give it a rating, you get one point. We don't necessarily care about that for our project. If you add a photo, you get five points. And that's great because all of a sudden you have your photo plus the Google image photo, there's more photo data on the establishment. If you answer some questions somebody asked, uh, you get a certain number of points. Um, if you check some fact, you get a point, et cetera. So the idea is through crowds and you, people love points. And if you get points, you get status uh, and it's a community like any other. Plus um, uh, if you get enough points then you get early access to certain Google services. So it, it becomes a thing that actually incentivizes quite a, quite a few people. So there's kind of this army of people who are continuously checking based on their local knowledge, what Google Maps is telling us it's in a particular establishment. And this is continuously updated nonstop. And so, yeah, by the time you take the official administrative data, update it with the Google Street Map imagery and the gazillion, I don't even know what the number is, but it's multiple paid bytes of data, um, updated with people. What you have is an unusually rich data source that gives you a much closer look at kind of the thought experiment I was describing earlier, what you would experience when you kind of step out of your, your, your home and look for a bank than any other source I can think of. And finally, we confirmed this also in two different ways. So when we first began this project, um, I got access uh, with researchers at Microsoft through something called Microsoft Bing Data, B-I-N-G. Microsoft Bing is like Google's, it's a Microsoft competitor to Google it's a search engine, and they also have their own maps data. And we did a version of what I'm gonna show you in a minute with uh, Bing for a limited number of cities. And we compared the number of establishments that Bing found with the number of establishments that Google found. And it was, uh, I'm not gonna say unbelievable, but it kind of a little unbelievable how Google just had far, far, far more establishments. Then we took um, uh, sections of Boston that we knew. And we say, okay, well, maybe Google has more places but you know, they're, they're joke places or they're not real places or the people who are crowdsourcing are making it up and so on. And actually the places that were on Google Maps but not on Bing Maps were in fact all real places that we physically knew from our experience of the neighborhoods. So by this point, I'm actually quite convinced that and so we switched to Google. And so, um, you know, Google is a terrible company in many respects, um, but it has great data for this project. Okay. I'm happy to describe a little bit more, but we used the uh, premium version of the Google API to extract the data. And then uh, we used a script that essentially opened a Firefox browser and extracted more data to make sure that our data were good uh, because uh, the Google Places API, even though it's based on Google Maps data, doesn't quite give you everything in Google Maps for data. I won't say more about that, although um, I'm happy to answer more questions if you care. Okay, so what exactly did we do? Okay, just to, uh, so this is a census block and this is a block group as you can see. So the idea is first we identified the geographic center of the block, the centroid. And then we asked the script, what it did then is found the 10 closest institutions as the crow flies. Meaning and, uh, if you draw a straight line, for example, from my home, uh, literally on, a, uh, on the, if you take a ruler on the map from my home to the supermarket, for example, but in this case, just banks and, and uh, AFIs, uh, find the 10 closest, okay? Um, then uh, what you do is you try to figure out, for example, for foot travel, the number of minutes it takes to get there. So just to give you an example, uh, this, is the shortest line. So therefore it would look like the closest, right? And so then we calculate how long it would take to walk, 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 and the answer is three minutes, okay? And so you would think that the closest institution for this block is three minutes, but suppose the block has, you know, uh, train tracks or a high wall or a river or whatever. Um, then in that context, it actually takes quite a bit of time to get to all of these establishments because you have to kind of go around it or around it. And so in that context, this becomes the closest one. 
And so our calculus for the closest institution means the fastest to get to. This is sort of the key. This is part of the, why it's a time-based measure as opposed to a spatial, sort of spatial, but it's really based on time, the fastest to get to. So in this contest, the actual fastest to get to establishment is four minutes away, not three minutes away. So then on that basis, we said, okay, for this block group, the the variable, the, the, the for this value, the value for this very for this block group, the value of the variable is four minutes. Then we did it for every single other block um, in the block group. And then we took the average for the block group. And so for example, and this is totally hypothetical, in this block group, the average might be four and a half minutes. Okay. And then we repeated that for every block in each of the 19 cities. It took forever. I think it was something like six million queries. Um, but now we're now we're pretty good at it. <laughs> A few years ago, we were terrible at it. But that was the idea, and we did this by for travel by foot, and by car, and by public transit, and for alternative financial institutions, and for banks. Uh, Randall, is that a hand? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, you can hear me okay. Can I just ask in you? Estimate of distance and sort of, and then test whether it's well calibrated to people's own expectations. Um, or is the idea that people are you trying to imagine a world where people are actually using Google? Gotcha. Thank you. That's a and it's really important clarifying question. So it's kind of unfortunate that Google Maps is called Google Maps. Um, think about it as Google database. So the only reason, the only purpose for which we used Google Maps was to get data on the locations of banks and AFIs for no other purpose. So we certainly weren't trying to sort of, the function I described is actually not what we did. What we did is take the database that the function I described relies on because that database is really good. So then once we had our data, Literally, once we had a whole bunch of coordinates, latitude and longitude for banks and for AFIs for all our cities, then we went and we ran our own script to figure out how long it would take to walk, how long it would take to drive, how long it would take to public to take public transit. For walk, I should have said something. For walking and trans and driving, it's a pretty straightforward process. Uh, for um, for public transit, it's a little bit more complicated. So public transit, there are databases where you can get, I think, uh, I think we use the database from uh, Open Trip Planner. Uh, you can, so the question is, you know, how do you figure out whether it takes a long time or a little time to get to some other place? If, for example, you don't know the bus route and you don't know the bus schedule. We do know the bus route, but what if you don't know, you know, if you, for example, if I'm trying to go to that, that supermarket in Harlem that I described earlier, it will take me longer uh, on a weekend than during the weekend or than during the weekday or in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day because there are more buses uh, during the day than late at night. Okay, so how do we deal with this problem? Uh, the way we dealt with this problem is we picked a day in the middle of the week, uh, uh, in the middle of the day. So I think we picked a Wednesday uh, at 12, uh, and I don't remember the particular day, but it was a, I think it was a March something, Wednesday uh, at 12 p.m. And then we did the calculus for that time uh, and that date for all of the cities, all of the blocks. And so what that meant is that we could take into account how long from 12 o'clock on that March, whatever it was, you would have to wait for the bus to come in if you're taking public transit. Yeah. And so that was the idea behind the process. I'm more thinking about like, what, what if I use a gypsy cab? Like I have a gypsy cab that can get me from upper Manhattan to one part of a, you know, Queens really quickly. Yeah. And I, I mean, and, and again, I guess the, the real question there is given all of these potential nonlinearities, is this, this is just a, a first approximation. Exactly. So we, exactly. So we're not actually capturing experience. So on the, on the jigs, well, the first thing you're going to see is we're not capturing experience. We're doing that more later. I just don't have the, the full data yet, but it's a, that's a beautiful term. It's a first approximation. Also, the gypsy cab data, even though it's public transit, we would capture with our car data. It's just that we don't capture uh, gypsy cab data with the other one. Our public transit data are for buses walking to and from the station, trains walking to and from the station, trams walking to and from the station. And this is, you know, 
what it would take from every single place. This is almost like if you in your head uh, wanted to extract your choice, your options from anywhere you are in these cities, you get our database with our script and you would have it. Okay. Okay, so that's it. Uh, and that is what could you doing. describe could you describe your script uh, or maybe you're going to do that at length? Yeah, but yeah. So, so the script. So what I did here is literally what the script. Did. Well, there's two. There were two important ones. There were there was a script to extract the data from the browser to complement the API. That's not really that important. I'm happy to. But that's not. I don't think that's what you're referring to. That's basically gave us the data the data points. The question is, what did we do with the data points? And this, so this is what the yeah. script did. The script, you know, number one, pick a block. Number two, search for um, all the banks in the city. So banks, all the banks in the city by uh, uh, latitude and longitude. Three, delete all but the 10 closest as the crow flies. Four, calculate the number of minutes it takes to get to the nearest. And so in this example, it would be four minutes because it would take longer to get to this one that's actually shorter. So, so you're using Google's uh, uh, estimate of how many minutes? No. So I have, no, so, so uh, how I should say one thing I forgot. Thank you. So this project is written with uh, Ryan Wang, Armin Akavan, and Mo Torres. Ryan and um, Armin are civil, Ryan is a civil engineer at Northeastern and uh, Arvin is, uh, uh, he's in the school of design. Anyway, they wrote the scripts. <laughs> and so we did not, so for example, um, for the public transit uh, process, we did what I just described. We picked a place, a time, and then we ran this process and calculated the number of minutes on the basis of that time. We did not ask Google. Yeah, but how do you know the number of minutes it takes to get from uh, the west side to the east side on on the, the 125th Street bus. Gotcha. Somebody uh, has to decide that. Yeah. So um, Open Trip Planner has data on the route, the schedule, the speed limit in the area. Uh, so out of the basic things, but not traffic. And so. Our estimates will be for the public transit will be screwed up on the basis of traffic. For um, car, same thing, except you don't need the schedule, it's um, speed limit. And so our estimates are based on known speed limits rather than how fast people really drive or something. And so, in that sense, that particular estimate is going to be not as good as Google. Um, because Google has data from actual travelers, so they'll know what, what people, what speed people actually travel at different times over the course of the thing. For foot, it's just simple estimates about the number of, you know, the, the I think it's 20 minutes per mile average or something, and you just scale it. So it's actually much more straightforward. And we, do, of course, know the entire infrastructure of the city, so we know, you know, whether you, you know, should you slow down because it's a hill? Uh, where do you have to make a you know, left to go around some big building as opposed to just going straight across, et cetera. So okay. I think our estimates are actually not quite um, what you would do on Google on your phone, uh, but pretty good. And what I would say is the foot estimates are pretty much going to be pretty much the same. The public transit and the car estimates will probably differ a little bit. And so to the extent that the car and the public transit results differ from the foot, you might consider whether you would get a sharper result if somehow you could get Google programmers to do our research for us. Ah, okay. So it's your your inability to get the Google data that leads you to do your own. We got the Google data. Oh, so may, let me let me maybe sort of clarify it this way. There's a big database that Google compiles through a super set of impressive mechanisms, and then Google programmers take those that big database and compute travel times for the purposes of selling your product. We took their amazing database and then we took our programmers and computed our own travel times. 
And because so we you, benefited from the part that they made accessible, yeah. but just didn't have the programmers for the second part of it. I, I, I hope that- Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Oh, look, this is this is pretty, it took a long time. It was pretty cool and I love it. And so please ask more questions if there's something I said that actually didn't make this clear. Okay. And by the way, this is one of the, this is actually the very first time I'm presenting some of the things that you're gonna see here. So um, I presented sort of slight version. So I, I appreciate making sure I'm getting, I'm making this clear. Okay, okay, okay. So that's the data. Um, wait, uh, how are we doing on time? Are we okay? Uh, you have until 1.30? Yeah, yeah good. we're fine until 4.30. Oh, we're good, yeah. we're good. Okay, okay, okay. So what do we find? Okay, so first, there are far more banks than AFIs. That's just the nature of things. And so on average, it's gonna be faster to get to an AFI than to a bank. If you're curious, um, in these 20 cities, uh, sorry, 19 cities, it takes on average um, 13 and a half minutes to walk to the closest, to the time closest bank. So anytime I use the term closest here, I mean closest by time. Uh, not closest in distance. Um, it takes about 12 minutes to take public transit and about 1.7 minutes to drive. To get to the fastest to get to AFI takes quite a bit longer on average, uh, about 25 minutes uh, by foot, about 21 minutes at public transit and about 2.6 minutes by car. What about race differences? So here's the, the, the sort of the variable, the outcome variable we're gonna care about, which is the proportion of block groups for which the AFI is faster to get to. And again, closer is in quotation marks because if I keep saying faster to get to, faster to get to, you're gonna go crazy. Okay, but it is faster to get to. So on average, um, uh, so for about 25% of block groups, uh, is it, faster to get to an AFI. And so for about 75%, it's faster to get uh, to a bank or it takes the same amount of time, okay? But here's what's interesting. If you look at block groups that are at least 50% white, in only a 10th of them is it on average faster to get to the nearest AFI than to the nearest bank. Whereas if you look at predominantly black uh, block groups, or 42 to 44%, depending on the mode of transit, is it actually faster to get to the nearest AFI than to the bank? For predominant Latino neighborhoods, it's actually a similar, uh, not quite as large, but large uh, difference. So what we're gonna do is figure out whether these differences hold after you adjust for the obvious things. So we're gonna run some regressions. And just to clarify, these are not causal estimates. It doesn't really make sense. We're trying to say, look, if you live in these neighborhoods, is it gonna be easier or harder after we think about adjusting for kind of the obvious things you would worry about? So what I'm gonna run is, a, this is I think a model everybody here is familiar with. It's a simple two level hierarchical generalized linear model with a logit link. So where the idea is that the outcome is a natural log of the odds that the nearest AFI is closer to the nearest bank. So the probability uh, in block group I in city J over one minus that probability, we take the natural log of that and that is the outcome. And the probability we care about is that the nearest AFI is, um, has a shorter time frame to reach than the nearest bank, okay? Uh, the model is pretty straightforward. So at the level one, we just take that outcome. We assume there's a city level intercept, a set of covariates at the neighborhood level and some error. And then all we're gonna do, this is a simple um, um, intercepts, a random intercepts model. All we're gonna do is assume that there's some random, these are random effects model, there's some random effect so that the variation in the intercept across cities uh, approximates around the variable. Plug and chug and you get that. And what matters is there's variation at both levels. That's it. Um, you know, there's a time I'm sure for something much more complicated, but uh, that is not the purpose of this paper. The purpose of this paper is to see, get some approximation about the experience that people would have. What are the covariates we care about? So uh, just about everything we could think of that we could measure. So proportion of uh, portion black, portion Latino, portion, uh, sorry, non-Hispanic black, non-Hispanic white, Hispanic slash Latino, uh, non-Hispanic Asian, um, 
non-inspiring other. Uh, portion poor, portion poor and born, uh, unemployment rate, portion college dedicated, home ownership rate, uh, housing density, so uh, number of housing units uh, per square mile, vacancy rate, um, uh, so the portion of housing units that are vacant, um, the proportion of units built before the year 2000 as a measure of the structural soundness of the neighborhood, population density, and we also have a measure of commercial density, uh, which is uh, the number per thousand residents of a large number of uh, uh, retail uh, um, office and manufacturing establishments in the neighborhood. Turns out there's mostly the first two. Okay, so here are the results. Um, I'm, I'm only going to show you this very briefly, and then I'm going to show you a figure that makes this a lot easier to interpret. Um, the only thing that matters here is this. So these are separate regressions uh, for portion foot, for, uh, sorry, for proximity by foot, proximity uh, in time by public transit, and proximity in time by car. And what you see here is that in a simple regression where we don't account for anything, there's a strong uh, proportion black and a strong proportion Latino effects. I'm just gonna um, read you through really quickly across the board. As you can see, that effect remains after control. It gets smaller, which is what you want, uh, pretty stably, but remains quite large and statistically significant. Portion Latino, again, by foot, you get a very similar story. For public transit, uh, portion black, you get a very, very similar story, very actually similar even coefficients. Uh, and this is part of the reason why I'm not too worried that we don't have Google programmers to take their awesome data that, and then uh, uh, run their own scripts for figuring out proximity by time uh, because our programmers can take their awesome data and do something that seems to hold uh, as well. For proportion Latino, again, uh, everything does sort of what it's supposed to, but again, the effect remains. For uh, driving, uh, similar again, for portion black, with proportion Latino, by the time you adjust for the other covariates and commercial density, uh, the effect actually gets quite small uh, and indistinguishable from zero. Okay, well, that's hard to kind of read and interpret. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna produce um, uh, predicted probabilities uh, for neighborhoods that are on the grand mean for our variables, but have specific characteristics. And so this is literally what you're gonna see in the next figure is the predicted probability that the AFI is faster to get to, okay? Um, for block groups that, as I said, are the grand mean for our variables, except um, they're either high poverty or very high poverty or quite low poverty. Um, so you're gonna to see two sets of figures. Um, and then uh, for block groups whose racial composition uh, is uh, for proportion black, proportion Latino, and proportion white, 10% yeah, or 30 or 50 or 70 or 90%. To make these estimates tractable, I'm gonna just a little, um, go into a little bit of detail because I think it's important. So for example, um, for a neighborhood that's at the grand mean of all variables, but 50% but poor and 10% black, uh, we still have to figure out what we're gonna specify as the racial composition of the, of the, of the 90% that's not black, okay? And so what we did is the following. Um, in our data set, the average block group um, in the grand mean, so across all block groups, is 8% Asian or Asian American and 2% other. So what we did is that for all of the estimates, we set uh, uh, that 10% to be, eight, again, 8% uh, Asian or Asian American and 2% other. And so for, and then we split the difference between the other two major groups, major racial groups for the others. So when you see, for example, a neighborhood that's 10% black, uh, that neighborhood is gonna be 8% Asian, 2% other, that's 20% total, and then 40% Asian, 40% uh, white, 40% Latino. If it's 30% black, it's gonna be 8% Asian, 2% other, that's 40%. And so then it's gonna be 30% black, uh, white, 30% uh, Latino, and so on, okay? And so that's what, that's what you're gonna see. And so here are the results. See, this is the sort of the core figure uh, that we care about. Okay, so here's the predicted probability. And please stop me. I, I, I think I'm being clear, but you never know. Please speak up and interrupt me. I, I love being interrupted. Um, I mean it, I'm not being facetious. Please interrupt me. 
Um, so here's the predicted probability that the AFI is faster to get to by the original composition and poverty level of the block group. Okay. On the top, you're seeing the predictions for high poverty neighborhoods and the bottom for low poverty neighborhoods. The dotted lines are the unadjusted figures, so not controlling or adjusting for anything. The solid lines are the adjusted figures with confidence intervals, okay? So let's look at the column where we vary the percent wide in the neighborhood. What you're saying here at the top is that for a high poverty neighborhood that is 10% white, the probability of the AFI is closer is about 27%. If the neighborhood is 30% white, it drops to about 21%. If it's 50% white, it drops to about 17%. If it's 70% white, it drops to about, I don't know, 13, 14%. And if it's 90% white, it drops to about 10%, even if it's a high, extremely high poverty neighborhood, it's 50% poor, okay? For low poverty white neighborhoods, you see a similar story, except of course, the entire curve shifts down because the probabilities are so much lower. But again, the more whites there are in the neighborhood, conditional on everything else we could think of, the lower the probability that the AFI is gonna be closer to get to. You know what's coming. In the middle column, what you see is that the complete opposite is true and dramatically so. As the proportion black increases in a high poverty neighborhood, the probability that the AFI close, is closer goes up dramatically. And that's regardless of whether the neighborhood is really poor and really not poor. In fact, look at um, where the slopes begin and end. Poverty almost doesn't matter because the race difference is so strong. The same is true for percent Hispanic, but to a much later degree. Notice that proportion Latino, uh, Latina, the adjusting makes a big difference and actually flattens the slope a lot. Uh, and then you might remember that from the previous paper and for poverty now again, flattens the slope a lot. So this is all just for travel by foot. Um, what happens for travel by public transit and travel by car? So all of the results are here. And uh, I don't know if you can see everything on the screen. I hope you can. So the top panels for travel by foot, this is the same figure you just saw, travel by public transit, travel by car. The big story is that um, the mode of transportation doesn't seem to make an enormous difference, except for, as we saw earlier, the proportion Latino effect, uh, and the, which essentially goes away regardless of which uh, neighborhood you're looking at. So put differently, um, especially for, for proportion black, but even for proportion Latino, as the proportion minority in the neighborhood increases, the probability that the AFI is closer increases dramatically. Even after we adjust for all of the obvious things we could think of that would have an impact on that probability, okay? And just kind of really quickly, these findings are robust to sort of a bunch of things that we thought would make a difference using a different uh, measure of poverty, income instead of the poverty rate, looking at cities that separated AFI that, that strictly uh, restrict AFIs. Uh, some cities have very strong restrictions about this separating California and Texas uh, cities, which are a lot of the largest cities in the country, uh, taking into account the reliability of the ACS estimates, really, I, I, we couldn't make this go away. The result is driven more by AFIs than by banks, uh, meaning uh, that if we just look at the distance of the nearest AFI, everything you saw pretty much will hold. Uh, but if you look at distance to banks, um, the the Race effect is there and very strongly, but after we adjust for enough things, it disappears. Do you have a conjecture as to why the Hispanic results go to go flat when you're thinking about cars? I mean, when you're considering cars? Um, not a good one. So um, as I mentioned a minute ago, uh, a large proportion of our cities are in California and Texas. And both Texas and California cities are, uh, uh, tend to be much more driving cities than old Rust Belt cities and cities in the East Coast. So for, I mean, New York and LA are, are obvious examples, but Houston, uh, um, uh, Austin, San Francisco, if you sort of go down the list, you need cars more often. 
And the only thing, as I said, not a very good one. So the only thing I can think of, and we've, we're, we, we have not explored this fully, um, is that as a result, sort of the way um, establishments are locating themselves vis-a-vis -vis Latinos is different. And uh, the probability, and, and, and so the car factor in that process ends up making a bigger difference. Uh, but I don't, have a, I, I don't have a good sort of intuition beyond that. Um, I do have a little bit of an intuition about preferences, which is maybe part of the part of the explanation behind sort of part of my might help sort of provide part of an explanation for the car issue, which I can get to in a moment. So, so you know, one thing that happened. So we 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 got that result and stuck, and um, we we said, well, let's send it out uh, as a research note. And so we sent it out as a research note uh, to kind of a general science journal. And the editor, who was not a, a conventional social scientist, said, well, you know, there's no finding here. This is obvious. Minorities just prefer alternative financial institutions uh, more than whites. Uh, it's just merely a function of preferences. And I don't even know why anybody uh, is bothering with this. This was, this was before George Floyd, uh, which I suspect might have uh, <laughs> played a role, but anyway, that was the idea. And so uh, we did two things. So the first thing we did is we took into account the fact that um, there are certain services for which you kind of need a bank no matter what. So uh, if you're college educated, you probably have a loan uh, and you need a bank to get that loan. If you're a homeowner, uh, you probably have a mortgage and you need a bank to get a mortgage. You can't get a mortgage from an AFI or a payday lender. Uh, conversely, we know that AFI services make the most sense for people who have few other options. And so it makes sense that AFIs would deliberately target people who are unemployed, who have very low incomes, and so on. So what we did is, okay, what happens? Here's a way of testing how strong the race effect is. What happens if we compare neighborhoods with a lot of the minorities who have the least need for AFIs and the most need for conventional banks to white neighborhoods that are on the opposite end of the spectrum. Meaning, what happens if we compare predominantly white, poor, unemployed, low education neighborhoods occupied primarily with renters with predominantly black and Latino neighborhoods that are affluent homeowner neighborhoods of highly employed college educated people. And so that's what you're seeing here. What we did is we took the entire distribution of block groups and for the, um, for the bars on the left, we took neighborhoods that are 50, we set the neighborhood poverty rate to 50% poor, 5 old, so very poor. We um, looked at the unemployment data and set the threshold at the 75th percentile, not the threshold, but the point estimate. So we, we are looking at neighborhoods that are at the 75th percentile of the unemployment distribution, so quite up there. Um, at the 25th percentile of the college education distribution and at the 75, um, 25th percentile of the home ownership distribution, right? So they're low educated, unemployed, uh, white, high poverty renters. And then for the uh, columns on the right, we did the same thing, but on the flip side, we took neighborhoods that were 10% poor. Uh, we said the neighborhood had to be 10% poor at the 25th percentile of the unemployment distribution, so very few unemployed people, at the 75th percentile of the home ownership and of the college educated distributions, okay? And so the idea is what happens when you compare the pink bars on the left, is in the pink bars to the neighbors that are 70% white, to the blue bars on the right, which are the neighbors that are 70% black or 70% Latino. It's pretty hard for me to imagine that the preferences uh, for those two opposite sets of groups are gonna be such that the rich minorities are gonna prefer that AFIs to get closer to get to than uh, whites on average and the poor whites. And so here's, the, here's a simple way of thinking about the comparison. Here's the probability that the AFI is faster to get there for poor, unemployed, low educated renter neighborhoods that are white, 70% white. Here is the higher probability that the AFI is closer to get to for affluent homeowner, 
70% black neighborhoods or affluent homeowner educated again, 70% Latino homeowners, especially greater. Uh, that is by, for travel by foot. For travel by car is a similar story. Sorry, for travel by public transit is a similar story. For travel by car, and again, this is, gets a little bit to depend on your question. I'm not sure how to interpret this just yet. It's not quite a similar story. There's no real difference. Um, and it's what you would expect for proportional Latino. Uh, one thing to um, keep in mind, of course, is the confidence intervals are quite large. So you can kind of be careful about the inferences you make, but it's pretty hard for me to think of this as a preference of story on the basis of this. However, um, okay, so um, that's, that's what I can show you so far that I'm pretty confident of. Um, but we did a second thing that I can uh, begin to show you that I hope uh, leads uh, to a little bit better insight on this question. So it still could be the case, I guess, but it still could be the case that on average, African-American individuals and Latino individuals prefer tech cashing places over banks and payday lenders over banks at higher rates than ones. We can think of all of the reasons that's implausible, um, uh, but um, you know, after after controlling for education and so on. But there's at least one set of reasons that make it plausible. You might remember this was a little bit after the George Floyd events, where a lot of people started posting experiences of racial dis discrimination on, on social media and these kind of experiences uh, went around a lot. And there was an experience, actually this happened a couple of times where an African-American had won the lottery, took his winning lottery ticket to a bank to cash it and the bank called the police. And when you, we first started hearing that, a lot of people started saying, oh my goodness, me too. And I had a similar experience and that's why I don't trust banks, et cetera. So you can imagine if, um, it is in fact the case that people are used to having uncomfortable experiences with banks, just as they are with police, just as we are with other kinds of hospitals, that they might actually prefer alternative institutions that are more commonly catering to people of their racial background, okay? I'm not saying I know that that's the case, but it's an empirical question. So what we did, and I don't have pretty pictures to show you, but I have some pictures to show you, actually some numbers, is this was uh, right before COVID. So in January, February of 2020, we launched a national representative survey of 3,000 respondents by NORC, a very short survey dedicated at eliciting stated preferences for banks versus AFIs. And it was a survey of African-Americans, Latinos, and whites based on what we saw in the, in the results I showed you a minute ago. And the idea was to see whether uh, there is in fact a, on average, just in the population at large, uh, a difference and B, whether we can account for it on the basis of um, socioeconomic differences, experiences with banks uh, or comfort level with banks, experiences or comfort level with um, AFIs or something else. And so this is what I'm going to show you. So this is what the survey looked like. Um, so as soon as you logged on, this is an online survey done by um, NORC's uh, Mary Speak panel group. We ask people, just focus on the top for a moment. We want to learn about your preferences for different financial institutions. Suppose you had a $100 check you needed to cash in person. Regular bank will refer to places such as Chase, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America. So uh, Chase, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America are the three largest banks in the country. Um, similarly, check cashing establishment refers to places such as Ace, Express, Ace Cash Express, United Check Cashing, or Money Tree. And those again are the three largest in the country. So they're the most likely to be recognized. The question for them is where would you cash the check? That's it. And you tell us, you would cash it in a regular, in a bank or you would cash it in the check cashing establishment. The order of the responses was randomized, et cetera. Separately, uh, they, there were other questions and I won't, I don't have time to discuss them and I don't have the full findings yet. We separately asked a similar question about payday lending and borrowing. We said, now suppose you need to borrow $500. Regular bank, again, refers to blah, blah, blah. Payday lender refers to places such as Check Into Cash, Advance America, or Ace Cash Express. And those three are the three largest payday lenders in the country. Question for them, 
where would you go for the loan? Again, pay the lending or that. That's it. Okay. So I don't have pretty predictions to show you, but I can show you the bottom line. Um, so on average, um, uh, regardless of race, most people prefer banks, okay, in both cases. However, um, this is the not pretty picture, but I just I really wanted to share this because I, I, I want ideas about how to interpret this. Um, this is a simple uh, logit model. It's a weighted logit model. So this is naturally representative data uh, for uh, the probability that you prefer the bank over the check cashing place in response to the first question. This is the effect of race of uh, being black, it's not non-Hispanic black, uh, other multiracial, non-Hispanic Latino or Asian. Okay, and as what you can see here, actually we did have Asians in this study, sorry, I'm just mixing it with a different study. Um, and so what you can see first is um, there's a strong black effect and a strong Latino effect when you don't account for anything. So in other words, the average African-American in the United States and the average Latino are both more likely to prefer the check cashing place than the average white American and the average African-American much more likely than the average Latino. Once you account for demographics, the Latino difference gets really small and essentially disappears. The black difference remains. So this is, uh, and we account for the obvious things you would in a study like this. So education, income, unemployment, uh, homeownership, age, uh, there's gender controls in the here, although that's not gonna matter much, uh, et cetera. But, and so it remains, but here's what's interesting. Once you account, I mean, totally consistent with all that stuff that was in social media for your kind of, we have a set of measures for how people feel about banks. This is based on a survey. I, I don't remember if it's from the current population survey or from one of the federal uh, uh, reserve bank surveys, but essentially a battery of measures for how you comfortable you feel with banks, how convenient you find them and how much you appreciate them. Um, the difference goes away. Um, and so there is something to the idea that people seem to be preferring them, but a lot because of bad experience or, not, or attitudes about banks. Once you account for feelings for, so potentially positive feelings for check cashing places, they actually go away even more. Um, I'm, I, I'm interested in networks. <laughs> ask, ask a quick question about, do you know other people who have check cashed and check cashing didn't matter? And these are state fixed effects. It's a national sample. Um, if, uh, so that's interesting. If, or at least I think it's interesting. Now, what about banks of repayday lenders? Um, same story, large differences. Demographic conditions reduce those differences, but again, they don't really make them go away. They're quite robust. Feelings for banks reduce the differences, but again, they don't go away. Um, feelings, again, the composites about payday lenders reduce the uh, difference even further, but again, they'll make them go away. Network effects make the difference, uh, again, get smaller, gets a little bigger here, which I don't quite understand, uh, but it's not much, so I'm not going to lose too much sleep over it. Um, and state fixed effects, uh, state differences don't seem to make a very large difference. And so I can't make the payday lender uh, difference go away. Um, this table I'm reasonably confident in, we're still analyzing the data, but it's not gonna change much from this, I'm pretty sure. Um, so what we're doing now is doing interviews. Uh, begin In the midst of COVID, we started piloting, interviewing people about uh, how they think about and how they make decisions about whether to go to a payday lending institution uh, versus a bank, the role of networks in the process. And I'm guessing in a year or two, I'll have some results to show from that. Okay. Uh, that's it. I'm happy to take more questions. I would love to hear ideas about what's going on here. Um, and of course, any other comments or critiques that you think uh, would be helpful for a paper like this. That's great. So let me start off with one real quick uh, question and then I'll move to Patrick Huvelin. He's got his hand up. Um, so it looked to me at the, when you showed the questions that you asked, um, yeah, there we go. It says, where would you cash the check? Not where would you prefer to cash the check, right? So yes. I'm wondering how you think about this because if check cashing places are much more readily available, say in black neighborhoods, then 
if I were answering the question and I was black and lived in a black neighborhood, I might think, well, you know, of course I'm going to go to the local check cashing place because access, to, I mean, that's what's closest and easiest, right? So I wonder how yeah. much you're actually capturing in that question of exactly the patterns that you're yeah. concerned about. That's a great question. Um, we didn't do that in this particular question, and we would have. That that would have been a better question. I totally agree. We did something you could, else. You could solve it in your interviews, right? With in your in-depth interviews. Well, we're going to do things. So after we do that round of interviews, then we're going to go back into another national survey, mm -hmm. and uh, with better questions because we'll know more about what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so um, I actually like your wording more than ours for this question. Um, we did something else that provides a little bit of insight on it, and I have to apologize. I don't have any results to show you. But we did another version of this uh, where we ran an experiment. And we'll, and so um, what we did is, um, and I'm just trying to describe it really quickly, separately for check cashing and for borrowing, uh, we, we told respondents that they were going to see four different scenarios involving, so let's begin with check cashing. We told them you're gonna see four different scenarios where you have to, uh, we have a hundred dollar check that you need to cash in person. And then um, for each scenario, they had a two option choice set, uh, check cashing place or bank. Uh, they saw on the screen. And again, at random, uh, they saw one person supposed to the other. And uh, we manipulated the attributes of the check cashing place and of the bank uh, in the experiment. So we manipulated the, uh, number of minutes it takes to get there. Uh, and we left unspecified the mode of transit, five minutes versus 10 minutes. And so that helps speak to a little bit kind of your idea mm -hmm. that maybe they're thinking, well, this is just closer, so I'm gonna go there. Um, we manipulated uh, the fees you had to pay. Uh, we manipulated um, one more characteristic and it's escaping me. Um, oh, whether you need to have uh, an account in the institution. Mm. And all of these were run at random. I run tons of these, uh, four per person for all respondents. Um, and then for the payday lending, we did a version of the, and again, we asked, we did ask, where would you cash the check? Um, and so, uh, but um, at least we manipulated at least part of what you would think of as an explanation, which is the ease of access of the institution. Mm -hmm. um, in the second one, we did the same thing, um, uh, and it was borrowing $500, and we manipulated the time, uh, the amount you had to pay back, and the time period during which you had to pay it. And again, random, it was everything was randomized, randomized, randomized. And um, we still found a uh, race difference. And we found that each of the three conditions mattered. I, I, and I'm sorry, I don't have to, I'm not able to show you the details, so I, I apologize. So anyway, we found something to do with the intuition that, you know, you know, the way people are thinking about it, the, the, the proximity does play some role. Uh, but even if we accounted for that in this simple dichotomous way, we, we see an effect. So that makes me wonder uh, whether, even though I would actually have used your wording, <laughs> uh, where were you a year ago? Um, I think, well, it doesn't matter. We're going to do this again. 2020 um, hindsight. So. Exactly. Uh, All right. More ways than one. Okay. Yeah, sorry, no, Patrick. That's, that's life. Um, Patrick, did you have a question? I didn't have a question. I was just uh, clapping and uh, I wanted to thank Mario for a great uh, presentation. But we give you the floor, so I'll take it. Um, yeah, I guess the, the thing I was wondering is how you factor in the fact that some of these pay loan centers might actually target some neighborhoods, right? They, so I, I, I guess they are not open randomly. They do some type of marketing. And I'm not sure how you would, uh, looking at the, maybe the same type of data you were looking at in terms of race composition and poverty rates. Um, so yeah. I'm not sure how you would do, you know, get this without get a long historical period. Um, maybe yeah. one idea is, I, I don't know enough about this market, but are, are they uh, mom and pop shops and, and large companies? So I was thinking maybe the, if there's a way to discriminate between the two, I guess the, the, the targeting that I was mentioning is more likely to happen at the level of a, uh, a big corporate company that um, opens 
specific branches, uh, I mean branches in specific neighborhood, why the, the smaller uh, privately owned store might have been there for uh, 40 years and they haven't adjusted to the, to the neighborhood composition as much. Yes, that's, that's a great question. So, um, so at this point, there are very few small scale uh, payday lenders or check cashing places. Sorry, mom and pop. Um, but there are quite a, f but there, you know, between mom and pop and large, it's actually quite a bit. And so there are quite a large number of regional ones, kind of mid size, you know, couple uh, establishment, four or five establishment kind of institutions that, I mean, I, I, I agree with your intuition. They're not, they're not going to have, you know, reams of data and tech specialists running regressions to figure out where they should locate. And so um, that, I think that could be an interesting uh, thing. My intuition so far has been, um, out, so at this point, um, my inclination, my belief, I guess, is that AFIs are in fact targeting minority neighborhoods uh, uh, more than white neighborhoods, that they are not that rational uh, when doing so. So yes, there are people running regressions, et cetera, but I mean, we all know how this kind of works. You know, the, the whole bunch of biases creep in, you know, how seriously you take the race part, you know, um, and so I suspect that in spite of their attempts, they're just trying to make money. There's some, they kind of weigh race more than, more than, more than you would think. Um, and, but so, but I should say that's my prior. And so what I'm doing is trying to get as close to the other part, which I can get access to and I know how to think about, which is the preferences part. Uh, to see if I can to see how much I can sort of chip away from that perspective. Um, somebody who knows way more about location of, uh, and how to estimate the causal effects of uh, geographic characteristics over time on location because you can do that part. I'm happy to work with you. Um, but this is, I suspect this might be a kind of thing where we get at this sort of both perspectives. My kind of predilection has been um, in part because of how I approach this project. The individual, and also because I'm 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 curious. Like I just don't understand the payday lending difference. I don't get it. I don't know why I can't make it go away. Um, Megan Potter. Hi. Sorry that my camera doesn't work, but thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I was curious if you have considered tracking the actual usage of these places versus just preferences. So using possibly cell phone data to see the different census tracts or blocks where these people are coming from and um, where what institutions they're actually going to versus a survey-based analysis. Uh, oh, okay. So th the first answer was gonna be yes, meaning in that second survey we're gonna do after we do all of this uh, uh, field node data, we're gonna capture behavior. Um, but it sounds like what you're describing is something a little different, meaning uh, maybe using something like key by key data or something like that to capture the places people are going and inferring their behavior on that basis. Am I reading that right? Yeah, we, I started working a little bit with safe graph data um, and it basically finds a way to capture people's movements and um, figures out where they live depending on time spent overnight. So you can somewhat analyze aggregated data by census tract of where um, people are going to and for how long and whatnot and seeing patterns in that, which may be more of a supplemental piece gotcha. of information for your research, yeah. but I was just curious if you considered it. Yeah, okay, now I get you. The short answer is, yeah, I think it's great. Um, so I've used such, I mean, I've done versions of this myself um, on a somewhat related question, but looking at more travel movements. So we use Twitter data. So we scraped about 18 months worth of Twitter data uh, back when Twitter allowed and released in their API uh, geotag tweets. And so we used geotag tweet location to track people's movements across city. And since we had so many people, we could make pretty good inferences about what people from a particular kind of neighborhood were likely traveling to. And so we've done a version of that. There's a guy at MIT who does a little bit something closer to what you're describing, which is he took those kinds of data, but from a company called Cube, I don't know if it's Cubic or QIQ, sorry. Uh, but it's, it's cube IQ, that's how it's spelled. Uh, it's scary data. Um, and they, and so anyway, he, and I don't remember his name, but I can get it to you, did a version of what you're describing by um, um, 
merging the travel data from cell, these are travel data, not from, from, from Twitter, but from cell phones. So if you have any cell phone that tracks your movement in any way, you're probably in the Q by Q data set, the cubic data set. And so he did that. And then he superimposed location data for different kinds of establishments. And so he made inferences, for example, about whether there was class integration in some establishments more than others by looking at the residences of the people, uh, the, the income of the, of the, of the inferred residents of, of accounts and seeing whether they were more likely to travel if they're from different income brackets to say restaurants and to coffee houses. So we could do a version of that if you think about it from what you're saying. Uh, for tech caching places. Of course, the problem with, it's awesome. And I, I hadn't thought about actually doing that. I think it's a great idea. But I agree with you, it's complementary because you essentially don't have, in, you, have in, you have accounts and you can infer something about them based on their block group, but you don't actually have individuals. And so if you have the, that data, you can get a pretty large scale descriptive picture that'd be pretty cool of how much people from different neighbors are actually going to you know, the nearest AFI or the nearest bank. Uh, and then you can use uh, survey data where you ask people and you, you know, geolocate them and ask them, where did you actually individually, as an individual actually went? And then you can you know, relate that to their preferences to see how much preferences matters to behavior, to their background, to how much they moved, et cetera. So anyway, so that's how I would approach it. That's a great question. Gotcha, thank you. So I know it's 1.30 and oh. I see that there are, there's at least one more question in the chat. So Catherine, if you don't mind maybe staying, we're gonna um, begin this pro seminar. So I know there's a few graduate students that wanted to ask you questions. And if anyone else has questions that weren't answered, they're welcome to stay. Uh, the pro seminar will be from 1.30 to two. And just stay here on the, on the same Zoom link, no need to okay. switch. So, sorry, I went over. <laughs> no, no worries, that was a great talk. Thank you so much. Okay, sorry, I hadn't seen the chat, so I can start answering the chat question. Uh, was it beyond personal? This is from Catherine. Uh, I don't know if Catherine is here. Is this the question, um, Esmeralda? Yes, she's still here, and that Great. is the question. Okay, I'm going to read it out. Beyond personal negative feelings about banks, I wonder if Black customers might have a more structural distrust of banks uh, based on historical values of discrimination in lending. Exactly. Has anything like this come up in your interviews so far? So um, I share your intuition uh, very strongly. Um, and um, you know, I was using the example of personal experience, but the truth is everything spreads. And so even if nobody has you know, discriminated against me when trying to cash a lottery check or whatever, um, I hear it and I can relate it to other things that I've experienced. And so, yeah, I think absolutely. Um, the, and of course, everybody knows about the history of lending uh, interpersonally, and it's going to have an impact. Uh, the short answer is it hasn't come up so far. So we did about, we've done, we began interviews in the fall, uh, and we did maybe two dozen interviews, and um, uh, distrust of banks didn't show up in them. And then uh, we started up, uh, I had a baby, and so I could pause. <laughs> Uh, and we started up again late in the, sorry, this was in, we started in the summer. We did about 30, didn't show up. Um, we, we tried starting again in November, uh, but couldn't get much traction from African-American respondents. Um, again, because we have to do everything on Zoom, it's just a lot harder. And then we tried again uh, last, uh, last week and we haven't had much so far. So I don't know yet. Um, I suspect it's going to pop up. I mean, the work of Marcus Anthony Hunter, or Hunter and many others makes it clear to me that it's going to pop up. It just hasn't yet. Uh, and I'll, you know, if you contact me in a year, I'll let you know kind of what we found uh, uh, from those. Perfect. I'm actually going to go ahead and stop the recording now and we can have a more informal um, question oh, okay. Q&A.